Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inusor Education. Um, we continue talking about correlation um, among random variables. This lecture is part of the um, advanced mathematics course for teenagers and high school students. Um, it's presented on unizor.com. I suggest you to watch this lecture from this website because it has lots of very detailed notes for each lecture and uh, register students can um, actually engage in some educational process which involves enrollment and ends up uh, with exams. Obviously everything is voluntarily, the site is free, so it's up to you basically how to use it. So anyway, today we'll talk about um, uh, correlation and um, it will be three practical problems related to the lecture which um, I did on the theory of correlation before. Um, well, actually, I said there are three problems here, but it's actually the same problem with different numbers. And uh, mm, I think it's important to go through some practical calculations. Um, it, it helps to basically inculcate in your mind what exactly the correlation is and how it feels. So we will continue talking about two random variables, which take each one takes only two values. So here is the table which I will be using. So we have uh, variables C, which takes values of x1 and x2 with probabilities P and 1 minus P. And we have variable um, eta, which takes the values y1 and y2 with probabilities Q and 1 minus Q. Now, I actually put it in a nice table which I'm going to, to use instead of this. It's more convenient because there is a mutual distribution which I also have to register somehow. So the table, be, the table will look like this. So these are values which my um, random variable C will take and these are random variables for eta. Now, <coughs> why I put it in the table? Because I want to know the mutual distribution. So what's the probability of, let's say, C to take X1 and simultaneously uh, eta to take Y1? So we need some new information besides whatever I said before. So I have assumed that um, this probability is known and it's equal to R. That's actually sufficient to determine all other probabilities. Since the probability to take x1 is p, now x1 and, um, x and eta to take y1 is r, and probability of x1 and eta to take y2 should be obviously p minus r to have the total distribution to be equal to p. Because regardless of what eta take y1 or y2, uh, the probability of C to take X1 should be P. So if this is R, this is P minus R. Similarly, the probability of eta to take Y1 is Q, which means that the probability of eta to take Y1 and X1 to take R would be, uh, to take, uh, Xc to take X1 would be R, so Xc to take X2 is supposed to be Q minus R. And finally, for the same reason, this is supposed to be 1 minus P, this is supposed to be 1 minus Q. So this is supposed to be, let's just calculate, 1 minus P minus Q plus R, right? So 1 minus P minus Q plus R. 1 minus Q minus P plus R, it's exactly the same thing. So this is the table which I'm going to be using. This table contains not only the probabilities of um, X and eta to take corresponding values x1, x2, x1, y1, y2, but also the probability of their mutual taking certain values. Okay, now based on this, and I basically refer you to the previous um, lecture, I have calculated the correlation between these two variables. The correlation 
between C and eta is, and I, I'm just basically writing this formula because it was the derived in the previous lecture. Uh, square root of P, 1 minus P, Q, 1 minus Q. Okay, so that was the formula. So what I would like to do right now is to have three different problems with three different numerical values for P and R and Q and see what happens, how the correlation actually behaves. Right, okay. Uh, the problem number one. P is equal to one half and Q is equal to one half. So one minus P is also one half and one minus Q is also now, R would be a variable, and I would like to investigate how the correlation between these two variables, C and eta, behaves when uh, R is changing. Well, to know how it, how it actually goes, we have to really analyze how exactly R is supposed to be changing, right? Now, obviously, since r is a probability, it should be greater than zero. But that's actually not enough, because all of these must be also greater than zero. Which means that r is supposed to be less than or equal to p. Otherwise, this would be negative, right? It should be also less than or equal to q. Otherwise, this would be negative. And also, uh, this is supposed to be positive, right? So 1 minus P minus Q plus R is supposed to be greater than 0. So R is supposed to be greater than equal to P plus Q minus 1. So these are necessary conditions which actually should be taken into account whenever I'm analyzing R capital R correlation as a, func as a function of a small r, which is the mutual probability of uh, C and eta to take x1 and, and y1. Alright, so in this particular case, what does it mean? So r is supposed to be less than or equal to 1 half. This is exactly the same. And r is supposed to be greater or equal than p plus q minus 1, which is 0, right? 1 half, 1 half minus 1. So R is greater than zero and less than one half. So that's my condition. And that's where I have to really analyze how this formula behaves under these conditions. Well, obviously it's a linear form of R, which means it's monotonically changing from its positive coefficient with R, right? Because the square root is always positive. So uh, it means that uh, my uh, my straight line actually is increasing, right? So to take the uh, to find out what's the range of this function, we have to basically take its value with the smallest and the largest values of argument r. Now, with the smallest one, so r of c eta. I'll do it slightly different. I'll do it C eta of R as a function of R, right? So, um, in case uh, R is equal to zero, R C eta of zero is equal to, let's see what it is. Now, this is one half, one half, one half, and one half, right? So it would be 1 16th uh, square root, it's 1 fourth. So it would be 0 minus PQ 1 fourth divided by 1 fourth, which is minus 1. Right? It's minus 1 fourth divided by 1 fourth. Now, R of one half that's the maximum value for r and that's the maximum value for correlation if we 
uh, if we substitute uh, r here, would be equal to one half minus one fourth divided by one fourth, which is one fourth over one fourth, which is one. So as we see, our correlation uh, coefficient between these two variables, depending on their mutual uh, distribution or a parameter of mutual distribution r can be from minus 1 to 1. Now where is it equal to 0? Well it's equal to 0 when lowercase r is equal to 1 fourth because this is 1 fourth, 1 fourth minus 1 fourth. Now, what does it mean that r is equal to 1 fourth? It means r is equal to p times q, which means mutual um, distribution, mutual probability of c to take x1 and at the same time eta to take y1, whatever is r, is actually equal to the product of the corresponding probabilities, unconditional. Which means, when does it happen? It happens when, the, when these two variables are independent. So if variables are independent, then the lowercase r is equal to p times q. So the probability of c to take x1 and uh, eta to take y1, which is r, is equal to product of their probabilities. which is p times q. So for independent variables, we do have confirmed that our uh, correlation is actually zero. I mean, we did actually prove it uh, in, in the theoretical lecture before that, but, and it's obviously visible from the formula, but we just wanted to, to, to check it out. It's a, it's a reasonable check. And yes, indeed, uh, by the way, what's interesting is that this is a midpoint between this and this. One quarter is right in the middle between zero and one half. All right, fine. So um, our range is from minus one to one, to, to one for the coefficient of correlation. It's zero for independent variables. And that's basically all I wanted to know about these particular uh, random variables with these probabilities. That's my first problem. My second problem is slightly different, but only in numbers. <coughs> so my second problem is P is equal to one half and Q is equal to two thirds. Okay, now. What is my um, domain of this function? So what are the values for r? It's supposed to be less than or equal to one half and less than or equal to two thirds. So that actually covers it from the top as one half. Now this one, one half plus two thirds, one half plus two thirds minus one is equal to, uh, that's six, so it's three, plus uh, 4 minus 6 over 6, right? 3 6 is 1 half, 4 6 is 2 thirds, and 6 6 is 1, which is 1 6. So, now we see that R is changing in this range. So this is the domain of this function. Mind you, it's not down to zero. R cannot be equal to zero. So if my probabilities is R, R, R that like these, there is no way they are independent. I mean, they might be independent, but there is no way that correlation is equal to zero. Let's put it this way.
Okay, now, we have determined the domain of this function. Now let's determine the range. Now it's still the straight line, and what exactly is changing from and to? Well, let's just substitute end values and see what will be um, uh, the result. So R C eta of one six equals. All right. Well, first of all, let's talk about um, denominator. It's one half and one half. So it's one half and one half and two thirds and one third, right? Which is equal to one eighteenth. So it's square root of one eighteenth. Well, eighteen is actually square root of one eighteenth is um, it's nine times two, so it's one third square root of 2. And since it's denominator, I have to multiply over, so it would be 3 square root of 2 times 1 6, this is r, this is my lowest value, minus p times q is 1 third. And what is it equal to? Well, one six minus one third. Well, one third minus one six is one six, so it's minus one six. So it will be minus six goes to denominator. This is three, so it's square root of two divided by two. Okay, R C eta of one half is equal to three square root of two times one half minus one third. Now, one half minus one third is three minus two six, which is one six. Six goes to denominator, so it's square root of two over two. And r is equal to p times q, which is one half times two thirds, which is uh, One third is where R equals to zero. So, as I said, R cannot be equal to zero, but the correlation can be equal to zero. That's one of the examples, by the way, when um, not necessarily independent. Uh, random variables um, can have correlation equal to zero. So if r is equal to one third and all others are calculated correspondingly, well, let me just write it down. That would be interesting, right? So r is equal to one third. p minus r, p is one half minus one third. This is one six. Uh, Q minus R, it's two-third minus one-third is one-third. And uh, one minus P minus Q plus R, that's zero. Right? Minus P minus Q, that's uh, minus three and minus four minus seven plus... 1, no, okay, 1 minus 1 minus 2 minus 2 third and minus 1 third. Too much. No, plus 1 third. Sorry. Plus 1 third. So it's 1 minus 1 half minus 1 third. This is. Uh, 3 plus 2, 5, 6, so it's 1, 6. Okay, here it is. Now, sum of these is equal to 2 thirds, and this is 1 third, 
which is right, sum of these is equal to one half and one half, which is also right. Yes. So this is the matrix of prob of mutual probabilities. And what's interesting is that with this definitely dependent random variables, we still have the correlation between them at zero. Now, if R is not one-third, but if it's moving to a, to a smaller value to one-sixth, the correlation would go to minus square root of two over two, and if it goes up to one-half, then the correlation would be positive. So that's very interesting property of correlation. All right, so that's problem number two. And finally, I would like to present a general problem without specifying concrete numbers. So, this is my general problem. Now, to make it a little bit more palatable, um, I don't want to get involved with different things. Let me just make some assumption. Um, in particular, I would like to make assumption that P is greater than one half, and um, let's put it this way: one half P Q. Now, if I have this, and I can definitely make this happen, because obviously either P or one minus P should be greater than one half, right? So I will assign x1 and x2 in such a way that the x1 would correspond to the probability which is greater than one half and x2 would be correspondingly smaller. I mean, if it's not, I would just reverse the numbers. Now, um, and again, same thing with q. Um, q can be either greater or smaller than p, right? There are no other ways. And if it's smaller, and I'll, I'll just reverse uh, y2 and y2, by 1 and by 2 and it would be the other way around. So I can always put some numbers indices in such a way that this particular inequality holds. And I need it. Why? Because that actually makes my life easier here. Because now I can, uh, instead of two equations as the top for instance, I can uh, use only one of them, which is which is p, the smaller one. So it's, if it's supposed to be smaller than p and smaller than q, q is larger than p, then it's completely sufficient to say that it's smaller than p. Now here, if it's greater than p plus q minus 1, uh, then I can actually just, uh, let me just try to leave it alone as it is. We'll see if it, if it works. So p plus q minus 1 greater than, less than, less than p. Okay? By the way, this on the left is definitely smaller than this one, because this piece is obviously negative, right? Or equal to zero. So this is the correct inequality. Um, just to check, you know, every once in a while when you see some formula and you're not really sure, if there is some simple way to check if it's true, I mean, that's one of those little checks. All right, so now let's see what happens if I will substitute the smallest, the smallest and the largest value into this um, expression for correlation. Okay, let's start from the smallest. So I have P plus Q minus one minus PQ. That's equal to p times 1 minus q, it's this one and this one, right? I factor out p, and what's remaining? q minus 1, or with a minus sign, 1 minus q, which means equal to 1 minus q now can be taken out, and what will be remain? p minus 1. I will put minus again here because I would like to deal with positive values. So now, that's what I have. So this is the negative value of the numerator. Now let's divide it by by denominator. 
of p plus q minus 1 equals square root of p1 minus p q1 minus q well so what happens well first of all it's minus now you have minus 1 minus p here and square root of 1 minus p so what will be will be 1 square root of 1 minus p same thing 1 minus q divided by square root of pq well, oh let me just have one square root 1 minus p 1 minus q p q now we we're talking about correlation coefficient supposed to be less than one by absolute value right so what about this well let's see 1 minus p divided by p so p is greater than one half so 1 minus p is smaller than 1 half so that's why the ratio is less than 1 and similarly the same thing q is also greater than 1 half which means 1 minus q is supposed to be smaller than 1 half so we are divided smaller by bigger so that's why we have them both less than 1 and the square root will also be less than 1 so we have a negative number by, by absolute value not exceeding 1 so that's my range on the left side, right? So I have square root of 1 minus p, 1 minus q, p, q. Now, what do we have on the, on the right side? So to get the largest value for the r, I have to put the largest value for the argument, which is p. So what will be? Will be p minus pq, so I will uh, factor out p, and I will have 1 minus q divided by square root of p times 1 minus p, q, 1 minus q. So what will be here? Well, p and square root of p, it would be square root of p and square root of 1 minus q divided by 1 minus p and q square root of everything right that's what i will have square root of p on the top and square root of 1 minus q on the top 1 minus p on the bottom and q on the bottom now let me just write it slightly differently so you will see that it's also smaller than 1. That's my original assumption and that's why this is less than 1. Now 1 minus q, since q is greater than p, 1 minus q is smaller than 1 minus p, right? So again it will be smaller divided by bigger and that will be also less than 1. So the result is, as you see, again some number which is less than 1 by absolute value and I will put it here p1 minus q divided by q1 minus p so that's my range for correlation coefficient in this particular relatively general case when my two variables take only two values so under this assumption, and again, that's our assumption without any problems, we can make it by changing the indices. So with this assumption, we have the correlation coefficient, I forgot to put minus in front of it, is in this range. And where is it equal to zero? Well, obviously when r is equal to pq, because that's what makes this numerator to be equal to zero it's somewhere in between these two these two numbers pq should be somewhere well obviously well let, let's just uh, verify it. i mean obviously pq is less than uh, the p right because q is the probability which is supposed to be from zero to one right now is pq 
how is it related to p plus q minus 1. Uh, let's check this particular inequality. Well, let's put everything on the right. So I will have pq greater than or equal to, uh, sorry, pq minus p minus q plus 1. It should be equal greater or equal than 0. Is this true? p times q minus 1 minus q minus 1, right? Or let me just do it the other way around. It's 1 minus q. It's minus p times 1 minus q plus 1 minus q which is 1 minus p times 1 minus q. And this is obviously greater or equal than 0. And all these uh, transformations are reversible. So from this, I will derive this one. So pq is indeed somewhere between the extreme values of r. Basically, that's it. That's all I wanted to talk about. I presented three different calculations, including one relatively general. And uh, this well exemplifies how the correlation coefficient is actually calculated. It has nothing to do with statistics. Uh, statistical um, distributions are used also to, uh, to, to check what the correlation coefficient is. And as you see, at least in this particular example, and that's a very, very important observation. Correlation can be equal to zero. Remember the second example, when I have one half and two thirds. Uh, we had a special value for their mutual distribution R. So let me just remind you, R was from one sixth to one half, and whenever R was equal to one third, I had the correlation between these variables equal to zero. And obviously these two variables don't seem to be like completely independent or anything like that. So the correlation to be equal to zero is not really a, significa a signification of independence. It just can happen that if mutual distribution is such and such, then basically, yes then the correlation coefficient, coefficient can be equal to zero. And obviously, uh, and, and that's again a different story, even if the correlation coefficient is positive and even closer to one, it doesn't really mean causation. Let me just repeat the same thing as I did in the previous lecture. Correlation does not mean causation, because you don't know wh whether xi uh, somehow reacts to eta or eta, reacts to Xi or some other random variable, some conditions basically are affecting both of them, Xi and Eta, in a similar fashion. And that's why I, they're changing in the same way. So this is completely different. This is not mathematics at all. Mathematics is only this. And all we can say is that this is how the correlation is um, basically calculated and how, it's, um, and how it looks in different cases like this. Um, another very important, probably, note is that correlation usually is um, relatively well, um, it's a relatively good indication whenever the um, uh, random variables are linearly related to each other. <coughs> because then the correlation be, be, is actually this linear coefficient. If you remember, whenever whenever we had a case like this, the correlation coefficient was actually was equal to 1, or minus 1, depending on the sine of A. So for linear case, correlation is important. For nonlinear case, what if you have something like this? To count on correlation coefficient to tell you something about this type of dependency, 
would not really work well. So again, in some cases, it's a good indication of uh, some kind of dependency. In some other, it might, it might not be. All right, that's it for today. Thank you very much and good luck.